Hi everybody! Hello! Rejoice! The Sarhal expansion has finally graced the Steam release of Anbenar. So, in this episode we will be looking in the complete opposite direction from the new continent and delve into the depths of the northern Dwarovar. Our host this time is Captain Duran Blue Shield and his adventurer company. Duran was not just an ordinary traveling scoundrel, he was the first cousin, once removed, of the Lord Elector of Silver Forge. He spent his youth wandering the world, from the edge of the deep woods to the city of Anben Kost, from the island of Nimskod to the Wine Bay and the Sorn Coast. Yet, as he aged, his wanderlust and fascination with ruins and history only grew. He visited the white walls of Castanor. He crossed through the flooded fields and cities of the gnoll-infested marshlands south of Corvuria. He gazed upon the infamous tower that was once the heart of Black Castanor. And yet, no matter how many sights he saw or stories he uncovered, it could never truly satisfy him. He wanted to see the Dwarovar. The orc-infested Serpent Spine Mountains hid a vast realm of dwarven cities larger than any human metropolis. Many pillared halls of stone dug deeper than the mountains were tall. All he ever truly wanted to do before he died was see those ancient halls, even just once. But as long as orcs still ruled the Serpent Spine, it was only a dream. And then, one day, whilst visiting the western dwarves of Rubyhold, he heard some news. The orcish warlord, Horgus Dukanson, had declared war on the surface world, pouring across the subcontinent of Eskan in a vengeful crusade in the name of their god, the Great Dukan. But only one detail echoed in Duran's mind to the point of obsession. The Serpent Spine Mountains had been emptied of orcs. In the Laurentish small country, in the town of Thomsbridge, he held a meeting between a number of relatives, adventurers, a wizard and their halfling host. An agreement was made, a contract signed and the company of Duran Blue Shield was formed. He knew that there would never be an opportunity like this ever again. He was not going to wait for the looters to destroy everything before he could see it and if the gods know. If the ancestors willed it, he would stop at nothing to reclaim and reforge the homelands he had never known. Years later, Duran Blue Shield, the halfling rogue Borian Barrows, and the human wizard Gundal Greywind would undertake a harrowing journey through the caves and roads of the Dwarovar. They were accompanied by a smattering of brave dwarves and other adventurers who were determined to delve into the heart of the ancient empire of Aul Dwarov. For a worshipper of dwarven ancestors, there were many lessons to be gained from their ancient wisdom. But where Duran was an admired administrator and charismatic leader, his military prowess was average for the standards of the day. The company was caught in a precarious situation, surrounded by darkness. Many dangers hid behind the dim lights of their torches. The captain took comfort in studying Murri Giantbreaker's code of combat bolstering the combat ability of the company's shield wall guards during their methodical exploration of the old dilapidated Daring Road Railway. The teachings would come in handy earlier than anticipated. The company, who fought only small warbands of wandering ogres and orcs since their descent into the mountain, had finally encountered an organized goblin tribe, the murderous True Dagger clan. Many in number and brutal in their tactics, the goblins did not match the sheer willpower and morale of the adventurers who refused to be stopped in their advance towards the old capital of Al Dwarov. The goblin camp was swiftly and thoroughly ransacked and destroyed, removing a significant danger in the region. At the next junction, the company came within scouting distance of the gates of the fabled Hall of Ancestors. Borian Barrows carefully sneaked towards the ancient hold to assess the dangers hidden behind the gates. He spotted a massive black orc operation, with raiding parties stripping off anything that they could find in the old abandoned houses and temples, while guards were posted in key positions, who displayed levels of discipline uncharacteristic to mere beasts. This clan not only held the greatest hold in dwarven history, but also the frame of the shattered crown of the old empire. Duran emboldened the men with speeches about unity and purpose while Gundal and Borian devised battle plans together with the generals of the company. The orcs were well entrenched and in their preferred environment. Their savagery was exceptional and each orc brute was a match for at least two adventurers. 
but in the end, determination and morale won the Battle of Almdir in the summer of 1447. The prize was incredible. The orcs had piled a massive amount of trophies, gold and other valuables in what became their throne room. All of this could be used to fund the purchase of additional supplies for the adventuring band, to be better prepared for future encounters. Among the looted artifacts, Durand's men found the Cronium Crown, a fearsome sight even if stripped bare of the gems that once adorned it. The dwarves of Haraz Oldum designed its platinum surface, but it was otherwise forged from Cronium, the heaviest metal in existence. Truly, it was a masterful piece of work. The company smiths restored it as best as they were able, in the hope that, if all the seven gems would eventually be located, perhaps the crown could eventually be reforged. Many orc stragglers still polluted the halls of Almdir, and Durand's men proceeded on a merciless campaign to purge the beasts. Regardless of the precious junk found within, the devastated halls were a sorry sight to behold. Restoring them was a gigantic task, and using them as a home for the company was going to be more costly than it was worth under the conditions following the victory against the Shattered Crown clan. In the following months, in an effort to survive the vengeful persecution of the dwarves, many black orcs decided to renounce Dukan and instead attempted to learn more about the dwarven ancestors. Seeing this as a lucrative opportunity, Captain Duran agreed to help the orcs study the dwarven teachings and perhaps enable them to rebuild the halls that they themselves ransacked in the past. The ancestor-worshipping Shattered Crown clan was thus released as a vassal state, under the supervision and authority of the dwarven adventurers. This enabled the companions to resume the exploration and charting of the old Dagrin Road. Perhaps the railway hub at Ernatvir would hold further stories about the fall of Aldwarov, or maybe serve as a significant exploration hub towards the deeper reaches of the Serpent Spine. Ernatvir was famous for its incredibly rich mushroom beds, the granary of the Dwarovar in its time, it was no surprise to find it infested by goblins. Unlike the orcs, the goblins were crafty and took advantage of the old railway quite ingeniously. They even expanded their clan into the surrounding caves using a rudimentary supply chain from the capital. Duran's adventurers were more prepared than ever to fight this new threat, and after a quick series of ambushes and battles, the goblins were scattered and conquered. Goblins, though, were as destructive as they were ingenious, and the company found themselves unable to traverse beyond the railway hub. Collapsed tunnels and treacherous caves were going to be an unsurmountable obstacle in their journeys further south and west. Duran Blue Shield was not ready to give up and settle, so he decided to release the Rail Skulker clan as a vassal as well, and proceeded north instead to link the Dagrin Road to the surface and perhaps commission more resources from Kanor to excavate the tunnels to the south at a later date. On their march north, a small band of mercenaries was sent to assist the orcs in Almdir with reconstruction. Further north, after the railroad junction, at the gates of Orlazam Azdir, Orion Barrows and a group of explorers discovered the entrance to a sinister spider den. The men dubbed it the Yi Dablerun. Chilling stories of swarms of giant spiders and piles upon piles of webbed cocoons terrified the adventurers, and they kept moving north, trying to put as much distance between them and the spider den as possible. After what felt like decades exploring and adventuring across the Dagrin Road, the adventuring company could finally boast with completing the map of the railway in Kastanmark 1469. In that month, they reached the gates of Durvajatun, northernmost hold of Aldwarov, if ignoring the prison colony from the giant's anvil. Alas, the surface proved to be just as dangerous as the mountain's depths. Centaur clans roamed the northern pass. The forests were infested with trolls and hungry ogre warbands would on occasion be spotted at the edges of the woods. Duran consulted with his allies and decided it would be wise to settle and fortify the hold and focus on connecting its infrastructure to the subjugated orc and goblin clans. Shattered crown orcs, in the years while Duran kept exploring, finished the reconstruction of Almdir. Their territories were annexed to be directly administered by the dwarves, and colonists were sent into the north to slowly set up ranger stations in the woods. Conquistadors set out to map the surface and spot any imminent dangers, as well as safe routes to the Serpent's Vale. 
pioneers took over from the marchers as priorities changed drastically. They planned out the reconstruction of the Dagrin Road, a long-term project that would last for many decades, yet linking the old capital to Durvajatun was going to be faster through the Northern Pass and Serpent's Vale. Two congruent projects that would be funded by the successes of the captain and his companions. Durvajatun was eventually restored and teams of engineers and builders began digging projects to deepen the new capital hold. The adventurer band that left Ruby Hold so many years ago was starting to look more and more like a small dwarven kingdom. This was the legacy of Duran Blue Shield, who sadly passed away of old age in the winter of 1488. The captain had lived a long life, far beyond any natural humans, witnessing the coming and passing of ages, innumerable triumphs and the overwhelming grief and loss that seeps into the cracks of the mind eroding it beyond measure. Yet Duran never wavered, becoming a stable hand to guide his band through trials and tribulation, acting as a stabilizing force and becoming synonymous with the rule of law. As the ever-turning cogs of time churned even further, he would be remembered for his great charisma. Everyone hoped that his successor, Thochga Sina Dizalstunad, would inherit but a fraction of his vast personality. While his body may have crumbled into dust, his memory and legacy would live on through the lasting impact he left upon his company and the Northern Dwarovar. Captain Thoka was not as skilled in diplomacy or warfare, but made up for it through magical prowess. She was a powerful sorceress and did not shy away from a fight. She proved herself by personally leading her men into battle against the moss-mouth ogres that squatted in the flooded swamps around Amdir, scorching the beasts with vicious fireballs. This action not only secured the old capital, but also opened up a new expansion path into the caves of the western Dwarovar. Scouts reported the presence of a small kobold band that took shelter in the lost cavern of Ofral Glarf a holy place and an excellently defensible position to control. When matters of war turned to matters of administration, the pioneer faction was proving to be quite an obstacle. Their 20% administrative inefficiency was really hurting a nascent realm who seeked to expand its borders, to protect the heartland. The studious dwarf herself, Tohka considered the history of the capital hold as she operated her company from. Durvajatun was once the hub for the brightest and most eccentric minds in Aldwarov to gather, argue and search for truth. Though many of their names and works had been lost to time, the empty libraries and broken laboratories left behind bore witness that genius existed here once and inspired her that it could exist again. Despite Duran's efforts to explore, adventure and reform the adventure band into a proper state, his efforts were not complete. Four out of five reforms were not enough to ensure a smooth transition to a kingdom, but the new captain decided that there was no time to waste. The legacy of Durvajatun was to be reborn. So it was declared, despite the 50 years of 15% administrative inefficiency that resulted from it, Durvajatun would build vertically, not horizontally. A verticality tainted with a hint of doom. It is in the nature of a dwarf that they need no sunlight, so they can dwell underground for their entire life. While that was true, they did need to breathe from time to time, and the miasmic wafts of gas that filled the tunnels and caves which called themselves air were laughable compared to the fresh mountain air that they could sample once again. Hunting and frolicking in the northern pass without fear of the many monsters that stalked the caves below. Permafrost was a treacherous thing in the new playground of the dwarves. Its harsh surface and cracking grounds were not to be scoffed at. To be able to traverse such locations safely was of paramount importance. Dwarves of Orlazama's deer were experts at traveling across the frozen ground. Slowly repopulating the Ramsteel hold allowed the Vajatuni to study the old equipment found there and mitigate the unnecessary costs in men and material to explore and settle the northern pass ahead of the Grey Orc menace to the west. The greatest of treasures was to be found, though, right above their heads. In the top levels of Durvajatun, 
the great lens of the Setzon Kupa, the greatest observatory from Laurent to Yanshen, was spared the ravages of the orcs. They plundered the deepest depths, but never reached the highest peaks. There it stood, exposed to the elements that warped and scratched it over the millennia. The lens had to be repaired along with the great elevator that conveyed the astronomers to the peak, burned in the madness that consumed the hold in its final hour. The gigantic blue dome was dotted with shining gems, facsimiles of the stars that the centerpiece, a grand runic telescope, was pointed towards. Rails to the side let the structure slide open, revealing the beautiful night sky over the northern pass. On clear nights, it was said that the whole universe presented itself from there. The telescope itself was a grand structure, long and lined with ancient runes, now refurbished and restored, to give the metal hull its purpose again. Catch the very light of the stars, the faint rays of blue and yellow and red shimmer that fascinated the ancestors in Durvajatun so long ago. At its base, the telescope sported a large observation platform, single chair tilted slightly to the back in front of the ocular wheel where the different eyepieces resided. To the left and right were panels with more runic inscriptions, spell-like contraptions that controlled everything in the room, from the dome doors to the focuser, the lens assembly, the filter and the ocular wheel. A single view through the telescope made all the time and money that the company poured into restoring it worth it. A thousand stars dotting the sky suddenly became a hundred thousand. The light magnified to a scale incomprehensible to simpler minds. The true beauty of the sky was not hidden within equations and blueprints, but it was there in plain sight, the sight of the stars themselves. A single sign hanged from the back of the chair. Do not use the telescope to look directly at the sun. With the Setsun Kupa repaired, the dwarves were now able once again to gain astral knowledge after so many centuries of ignorance. But all this knowledge could come with a heavy price. In 1502 there was nothing but enthusiasm in the hold, but the scientists could not shake a feeling of dread that hung at the back of their minds as they were preparing to record their observations. Initially repeated cycles of heat and cold began warping the lens, the picture projected no longer focused correctly and the aberrant pictures yielded little usable data. Replacing it was not an option without the help of the glassmakers in Orlg Helovar, but using the gemstone deposits within the capital hold, the dwarves could correct it a bit until the technology could be further understood. The dwarves had to occasionally remind themselves that they were just pretenders, sitting in the ruins of sapphire dwarf brilliance and the ancient center of knowledge had many hidden secrets to teach. Durvajatun hold ran deep, countless layers dug into the mountain like an ant hive. For months on end, scouting parties scoured every accessible part of the hold, searching not only for the usual troves of forgotten treasure, but also for any scrap of knowledge left behind by the original inhabitants. The hold proceeded unlike most others, not only down into the mountain's heart, but also up towards the lofty peaks of the serpent spine. Whilst the ground levels were comprised largely of armories and convoluted fortifications, and the lower levels contained the vault and living quarters, for every dwarf desired the cozy security provided deep in the earth. The upper levels seemed to have been used for the hold's administration and scholarly pursuits. The scouts had encountered crumbling archives where roof collapses have crushed the ancient tablets beyond recognition. Libraries blackened by ash or by rot, with the scrolls within reduced to dust and laboratories paved with broken glass. Any hope for even a scrap of forgotten knowledge had seemed futile until in an annex behind the sturdy stone door, which rendered the room airtight and free of decay, was discovered a set of notes and a map of what seemed to be research stations in the vicinity of Durvajatun. They described a series of increasingly common disturbances among the hold's astronomers. Apparently, overstressed by their work, several talented telescope operators had a number of violent outbursts. Nearly a dozen victims were killed and the perpetrators confined to cells. They refused to even consider the possibility of returning to their work. 
One quote in particular stood out. The stars are wrong. Scouring the remains made it abundantly clear that digging into the depths of the hold may reveal more such chambers, and this provided more astral knowledge to the dwarven kind, for better or for worse. The fall of Aulduarov was one of the greatest tragedies of all time. The dwarves and the entire world lost so much knowledge, so much cultural ingenuity and industrial genius that it was almost impossible to bear. In the decades since Duran Blue Shield left Kannor, only beasts were found squatting in the mountains, but as new Vajatun's colonies expanded north, they received a glimmer of hope. A faint star in the dark firmament that heralded a discovery so profound and important that a few dared to hope. There were survivors. There were survivors! Sapphire scouts met quartz scouts in the outer caves of the giant anvil. Former Captain Thoka immediately sent envoys to meet with the quartz dwarves. There were so many questions. How did they survive for over 7000 years? Whether they still followed the old gods? But most of all, she wanted to learn the true story behind the fall of Durva Jatun. They had heard all the fanciful stories of the hold collapsing of a magical mania from beyond the stars, but the dwarves of Krak Dumvror would have had the knowledge needed to dispel these wives' tales and establish the true history of the hold. That was not what happened. They not only confirmed the legends, but their account was, if anything, even more terrifying than the familiar stories. The sudden brutality, the chaos, the panic, the desperate struggle to flee and the constant fear of looking over one's shoulder. It was said that the madmen and their victims were impossible to tell apart, for they both had the same terror in their eyes. Maybe in truth the victims were afflicted as well. Krak Dumvror took in what refugees they could, panicked civilians, deserting soldiers, scholars bearing what ancient texts they could carry with them. The latter piqued Thorka's interest and she asked the quartz dwarves if they could see the texts firsthand. In response, she and her men were called upstart intruders and told that the quartz dwarves were the rightful owners of the records. The emissaries did not expect such a response and the meeting ended soon after. There was no fighting dwarven stubbornness at the negotiating table. The upstart intruders had to retaliate with a firm hand, but also abstain from reckless pillaging. They were not here to steal, they were here to learn. Krak Tumvror Hold would be respectfully subjugated. Not long after, the Dur Vajatuni gathered enough astral knowledge to try out the first real observation using the restored observatory. The first study target was fairly simple. The observatory was set on the closest and more obvious objects in the sky, the moon. The achievement was celebrated throughout the hold and the report following the observation was recorded and stored with great reverence and joy. It said the following. These being the writings of High Astronomer Duran Long Ai on 1505-1201. During the work of our engineers to fully bring the lenses of the telescope into focus, competing theories have begun to take hold amongst the astronomers. In particular, with regards to our nearest celestial neighbor, the Moon, many have begun to argue as to whether there might be a palace for the dame upon the surface, or that the corpse of Kuza might appear in some manner. Soon all will be clear, as our efforts have recently seen success. A few short hours ago, after seemingly endless reconfigurations of the Setsun Kupa, we have finally managed to focus the telescope on the Moon. While our vision remains restricted, strong evidence for two phenomena have been observed. Firstly, craters remarkably similar to those left by meteors that strike Halan have been witnessed. Reigniting the old theories about lunar dame steer. Secondly, at this stage, there appears to be no significant atmosphere about the sphere. It is possible that life might survive beneath the surface of the moon, yet we are hesitant to move beyond our findings into the realm of speculation. Regardless, the astronomy and engineering teams have broken into celebration. For the first time, we have observed another celestial body through the Setsun Kupa. 
With what few answers we have, more questions arise. Yet it is the first breakthrough in a long and precarious dig. May it be followed by many others. During the moon observation, a strange cloud was also discovered hovering in the atmosphere. So, for practice, the lens was focused to observe the strange hovering object. 1505-1201 2.34 Scheduled meteorological observations interrupted by an anomaly observed amidst high-flying clouds. Initial assumptions of the interference by avian defecation was disproven by exterior examination of the telescope. Upon refocusing, the object was revealed to be an airborne structure at an altitude of approximately 40,000 feet. The scale of the structure was difficult to determine due to significant cloud presence, but it appears to be a fortification, not dissimilar to a castle of human construction, upscaled by a factor of 3 or even 4. The propulsion system for the structure is not evident, but it maintains altitude and velocity with the local clouds. Hypothesis Rumors and legends across Halan have arisen over the past few millennia of cloud giants, a race that survived the fall of the giant empire of the Jotunglagen by taking to the sky in floating castles. Ridiculous as this idea may seem, there are few other candidates with the potential to construct and pilot immense airborne fortifications. If the cloud giants are real, they present a dire threat to dwarf kind. The only giant kin known to still exist are ogres and trolls, violent but dim-witted creatures that present little threat to a secure hold. The tales told of giants describe them as cunning adversaries, formidable foes that the ancestors warred with for millennia until their downfall. To lift an entire castle would take cunning artifice or powerful magic, presenting the horrific new possibility of an attack from above. Recommend immediate action to fortify the peak and research into airborne defense methods. If the hypothesis was true, this was indeed a scary prospect. It was not enough that the dwarves were in danger from creatures roaming the forests and the deep earth, but giants from the sky could rain down any moment on an unsuspecting world. More observations needed to be done to prove the hypothesis. The sky had so many secrets. Only a few years later, astronomer Nalin Good Anvil took a leap and planned the study of the sun, despite the warning found in the dilapidated chamber during the restoration of the hold. He noted his thoughts in the book titled The Chained Sun, a treatise on the sun's appearance in astronomy, mythology and religion. It is unknown what exactly the ancient dwarves thought about the sun. As mostly subterranean creatures, the impact of the sun and moon was much smaller in dwarven society than in those of most other races. The name Gurthbeil occurs in a few ancient sources as a possible sun god, though it is unclear what role he may have played in Aldwarov's mythology, or if he was ever truly worshipped. Even if he was, his importance declined along with most of the gods during the fall of Aldwarov, as most dwarfs turned from the distant cosmic powers of the gods to the more intimate powers of our ancestors. Even when in contact with humans like the Pulvari, who greatly venerated the sun, most dwarfs would keep to their own ritual practices, forming a parallel religion to the practices of the humans. A notable exception would be the great number of dwarfs who swore fealty to the court of Castellus along with Balgar. Yet even they would largely ignore the sun which the Canorians associated with the malevolent primordial Draxus. Yet while the Bulvari saw the sun as their salvation and the Canorians saw it as an antagonist, one thing they had in common was their belief in the sun as a diminished force, wishing to return to its true power. The Bulvari told of how Surael lost his body and awaits rebirth, while the Canorians spoke of how Draxus was imprisoned by Agrados. This motif can even be found among the vile goblins, with their chained sun goddess Tevaka Sunka. While some may have dismissed these ideas as mere superstition, our very astronomers have seen the truth in them. In the reports from the Setsun Kupa, you can read accounts of dark spots appearing and disappearing all over the sun, 
What could this be if not an assault by dark forces? Some have even seen the sun counter-attack by discharging massive flares into the void. We Sapphire Dwarves pride ourselves on being the only dwarves to truly look up instead of just staring down. Isn't it time we started to appreciate the full power of what lies in the celestial spheres? In 1513, the lens was pointed to peer further into the darkness of space. Quote, 1513, 01, 31, 1130. Through the eyes of the Setsun Kupa, a gradient turned from a glimmering point of light into a multicolored sphere not too dissimilar from what Halan must look like to an outside observer. The majority of a gradient's surface is red, like the god it was named after. There are, however, large smooth blue areas different in texture than the rest of the surface. Large white patches can also be seen and seem to gradually move across the surface. The most surprising discovery was that of small rings surrounding the planet. Conclusions The movements of the white areas and the smoothness of the blue indicate that they are clouds and water, respectively. This leaves the red areas the only ones to represent Agraden's actual surface, and we can conclude that the planet's outer layers are mainly made up of red minerals. Hypothesis No signs of Agrados or his famous vigil have been found though no one can quite agree on what the signs would even look like. The origin and composition of the rings are unclear. The only point of comparison we have is how the fields of echoes form a ring around the sun, and it is possible that these rings are similarly made out of countless smaller objects in orbit around the planet. While they look tiny to us, to anyone actually standing on a gradient they would have to be enormous. Speaking of which, the existence of clouds and water on the planet opens up the possibility of life forms on the surface, but the vast amount of red and the relatively smaller bodies of water means that Agraden's potential for life and civilization is likely much more limited than that of Halan. Following the observation of the red planet, the first bizarre incident took place within the scholarly circles of the hold. The atmosphere around the Setsun Kupa was normally one of eagerness and excitement, as befitted the task of restoring the lost knowledge of Aul Duarov. But that day something different happened. One of the astronomers, who had been particularly eager to look at the skies as often as possible, had started making a scene. Sobbing uncontrollably, he explained that IT kept following him wherever he went, and he would never find peace again. Any further inquiries into what it exactly was only resulted in what could be best described as disjointed ramblings. Seeing that something had gone wrong with his head, he was removed from his post and sent to a physician. This would have been the end of the incident if not for the two other astronomers who revealed that they also had recently been suffering from recurring anxiety that bore striking similarities to what the broken scholar had just described. Many explanations were put forth for why so many scholars would get these strange symptoms at the same time, including coincidence, workplace stress, or even a magical curse. The one explanation that nobody wanted to utter, but everyone knew, was the similarity between these events, the mythical astral terror that featured so prominently in the story of Dun Vajatun's original fall all those millennia ago. A series of new directives have been issued to the scholars of the Setsun Kupa in response to the incident, most importantly limiting the time that each individual astronomer got to look directly through the lens, and forbidding anyone from revealing the true details of what just happened to any outsider. If the public would learn of these events, the old stories might convince them to shut down the observatory permanently, which would be a disastrous loss of both the scientific progress and heritage of Aldwarov. It was decided to never allow this to happen. At the ground level, rangers and pioneers studied the maps that showed the locations of various research centers set up throughout the seemingly endless wastelands that surrounded them. It was doubtful that anything except for foundations remained, but the hope was that if these were found and somehow restored, the work that they were intended for could be resumed. This search pushed the colonies to the east, into the Ogre Hills and across the Centaur Plains. 
The warriors entered in conflicts with the cannibalistic beasts of Skurkokli and with the towering tyrants of Magarma. Yet despite the struggles, the frontier outpost of Ensmitlenmoa grew into a small market town from trading with more and more humans who emerged from the woods with whale bones and various exotic furs that they were willing to barter. Formal contact with these humans would help the dwarves to gain more knowledge of their homeland and perhaps allow further explorations to the east. The first meeting happened in a dark forest clearing, with the light of the moon shining through an opening in the trees, a gathering of the largest chieftains in the regions and some from further beyond as well. It seemed that this area had long served as a meeting ground for the Kukatodic people. Languages of dwarves and men were foreign to each other, but some work on mutual translation had already been underway for some time, and mages could remove the rough edges left in communication. Once everyone had gathered and the introductions concluded, a feast began. The dwarves told stories of their great fallen civilization and its fall, as well as the recent reconquests and successes. The humans told them of their history, how they had come to this land long ago from the west, how their southern kin in the plains had fallen to the centaurs, and how they had survived in the forests. The dwarves told them of the Setsun Kupa and the wonders of the sky, while the tribes described their crones and how they could talk to the spirits of the forest. Gifts were exchanged. Gems and metals from the mountains for guides that would show the way to the sea and the people who lived beyond it. The description of these people from beyond the sea were shockingly familiar. As they heard more of the Triunics, dwarves understood that they were dealing with an urban society, much like the one left behind in Kannur, miraculously located half a world away from the rest of the civilization. This renewed their determination to push east, the shores, and speak with this alien civilization as soon as possible. The Kukatodics, or Hill Watchers, also had an interesting history that suggested certain ties or interactions with the Setsun Kupa in the past. These theories remained pure conjecture. Durvajatun had to reach the Northern Sea. 1521-02-05-1135 Clear skies tonight permitted an excellent view of Ishil. The body is the brightest entity in the night sky other than the moon and shines with a pearly white hue constantly changing in texture with hints of yellow. Impossible to determine geographical features. Observations have as yet been unable to determine the rotational period due to difficulty distinguishing the surface. No orbiting bodies were observed. Conclusions The unusual color and texture of Ischil suggests that the body is swathed in clouds of some unknown gas with a yellow tinge implying the possible presence of brimstone. It seems to be the reflective nature of these clouds that makes Ischil's shine so brightly, seemingly disproving the popular belief among Pulvari that Nebu Ischil, like the other stars and planets, was a shard of light left behind from Surael's transfiguration into the sun. Hypothesis It is currently impossible to know whether Ischil has a sphere of rock beneath the clouds or if it is an object of pure clouds, if an inner solid planet exists, the clouds make it impossible to determine whether any life exists on the surface. Of course, with the recent revelations about the cloud giants, life existing on top of clouds cannot be ruled out either. Can someone else tell the Bulvari about this? Back in the Serpent's Pine, the old capital hold, Aldir, was once again becoming a bustling administrative center. It was, in its time, the greatest of all the holes in the Dwarovar. Here sat the High Kings themselves, presiding over their vast subterranean domain. While it was far away from the night sky, there the Dwarves of Yore had their libraries and large archives. It had been hard work piecing together a coherent story from what remained of these archives, but some details began to take shape. It seemed that during the final days of Durvajatun, all of Aulduarov was embroiled in conflict with a powerful enemy which was believed to be not only in Halan, but also on other worlds. Some had theorized this could be related to the ancient war between Aulduarov and the Precursor Empire, though no conclusive proof could be found. The Sapphire Dwarves seemed to have been interested in gaining preemptive knowledge of their enemy's actions. One document even brought up the possibility of the enemy constructing weapons out in the stars pointed towards Halan. 
These fears and curiosities seem to have led to increased use of the Setsun Kupa beyond the recommended usage, despite several high-ranking astronomers seeming to be against it. Their fears were well-founded, as one day the entire hold had suddenly collapsed. The details were sparse, but the archives talked of terrified refugees and even more terrified attackers, all refusing to look up at the sky. While much was still unclear, it seemed the historical fall of Durvajatun aligned very closely to the old legends. New questions emerged. Did this ancient enemy civilization really span across the stars? There was no real evidence, but it was clear that the Sapphire Dwarfs were convinced that this enemy and their constructs were very close to Halan. The study of the Andir records did instill a mild caution in the researchers and the race to the eastern coast put the Vajatuni in a small border conflict with some of the Triunic Federation members. But observations at home continued as planned. Next objective was the Klomrad, and the paper describing it read as such. 1526-03-02-10-11 Though precursor texts are few and far between, a number of these that have come into our possession include astronomical observations. Despite the vast span of time between their estimated date and the present, the uncanny precision of their measurements has been proven. Klomrad can frequently be seen with a naked eye and has oft been observed through the lesser telescopes, but using solely data from these records and the simple application of Jürgen Helmsmith's triplicate accords of celestial motion, the Setsun Kupa was strained to a patch of daylight sky. Lo and behold, tonight the Veiled One appeared, precisely in position down to an arc second. Klomrad's atmosphere bears a beautiful vertigris hue with stripes of dull silver. The size of the rocky surface beneath is indeterminate. The planet appears surprisingly large considering its relative distance from Halan. Detailed information on the Klomrad's orbiting bodies is expected to be included in the following report. Commentaries and hypotheses. The Klomrad, or the Veiled One, as translators have rendered it from their understanding of the precursor tongue is mentioned disproportionately amongst celestial bodies among their existent texts. The reason for this is unknown, but likely relates to the shifting copper-blue clouds that enshroud its surface. Just what the precursors believed to be concealed below the clouds is unknown. The Klomrad is at least 10 times greater in diameter than Halan, so any civilization existing there would likely be of either colossal size or enormous number. The precursors kept incredibly accurate records of its position and of the movement of its clouds. For what purpose? Did they believe the Veiled One to conceal a threat or perhaps a great treasure? Did they venerate it or did they fear it? Recommend further acquisition of ancient astronomical texts for analysis. Astronomers ended up occupying a peculiar place in Durvajatun, with a strange kind of celebrity following them. Their eccentric theories and unusual influence over the hold meant they often accumulated a following of hangers-on and yes-men listening to their every word. Their notebooks were guarded as if they were made of gold, for any rivals would pay a fortune for their secrets. Such constant attention would be enough to drive any sensible dwarf mad and any dwarf with their head in the clouds was nothing but sensible. One such stargazers cracked one night, filling the halls of the hold with terrifying screaming. Dwarfs were awoken on almost every level by a sound described as the shrieking of a goblin being flayed of its hide. Guards descended the main staircase, searching for whatever creature had uttered this grotesque sound, only to find the astronomer huddled under a pile of rubble at the lowest levels naked and covered in scratches of its own making. He had evidently attempted to continue his writings on the walls with the only material at hand, his own excrement. He fought like a cornered badger when taken into custody and his famously guarded notebook was cast to the floor of the observatory. Trying to figure out what cracked his mind so utterly, the other scholars perused his writings. You who read these notes likely think me a madman, but I assure you, I write these thoughts with a mind as clear as glass. You must seize the use of the Setsun Kupa immediately, smash it into pieces, 
Grind the lenses to dust and smelt it down so that none may look through its eye ever again. I can feel the malice of the stars burning upon me even now. It burns in my skin and I cannot get it out. No matter how I scrub, can't get it out. I can't get it out. I must dig deeper, seal off the upper levels and collapse every entrance. Dig as deep as possible and then deeper still. The world must forget this place. It is the only way we can ever be safe. Not to touch the earth, not to see the sun. Claw deeper and hide and bury yourselves beneath the mountain. Never look upon the night sky again. In the end, they could only wonder, what did he see through the lens? To make the atmosphere even more tense, astral terror deniers began to make their voices heard as well, raising the opinion that it was just a hoax made up by jealous failed astronomers who wanted to steal attention from their better peers. The state had to mitigate this new pressure in parallel. In the east of the realm, despite the initial border disputes, the people of the land of lakes turned out to be valuable friends, a people both skilled at arms and cultured in knowledge. A people that withstood the hooved horde migration. The great cleansings of Castan Beastbane pushed the savage centaurs in the Forbidden Plains. Each century they would surge through the northern pass in great herds, seeking to pillage the Serpent's Vale and beyond. Now that Durvajatun was reoccupied by dwarves, they became the first line of defense against the hordes. Another terrifying prospect. Coming almost as a relief, a war eventually ignited in the Northern Pass with a familiar foe, the encroaching kingdom of Grombar. Aggressive grey orcs stalked the forests and caverns west of the Serpent's Vale, and Durvajatun opted to strike at them preemptively, while the main contingent of their monstrous bands were busy raiding the human kingdoms of the Allen River. The constant reclamation of the Serpent's Spine added new dimension to the series of discoveries. More and more symbols, works and temples dedicated to the ancient Dwarven Pantheon were unearthed. These led to a spike in interest in such objects and places by many individuals. To those interested, the purpose was purely scholarly. Indeed, a few individuals had suffered what could only be described as profound experiences, saying that they felt closer than ever to their ancient history. Some stonekeepers said that this was the beginning of a serious spiritual degradation, while many others were unconcerned by the actions of a few fools and scholars. What looked like another bickering between fools could prove to be of grave concern to the stability of the realm. Durvajatun was above else a center of learning, an academy before its time. Yet scholarship required more than access to exclusive information and the Dwarven isolation had made it hard to appraise how their fledgling institutions truly compare to the outside world. Among the three eunuchs of the lake, one academy was held in great regard over all others, the one at Kov Talzar. Dwarves sent, therefore, a delegation over the northern sea to visit this institute and see what could be learned or adapted. They found that it was not hard to enroll in the classes. The school, despite its fame, prided itself on accepting even those applicants which other institutes found beneath them. The dwarves received strange looks at first, but anything further was clamped down on by the academy's administration. The students returned to the hold with reports that didn't concern the subjects themselves in particular, but the way they were taught. The methods used to teach were described to the scholars at home for instruction and inspiration on how to model their own academy and the first official Dwarven University after millennia was opened, while the observatory kept looking at the sky. 1536-0722-1236 Darol Sten was observed together with its seven moons. Darolsten's atmosphere bears its usual muddy brown-orange hue, slowly transitioning into a leathery tan. In a historic occasion, the existence of the seven dwarfs, long considered to border on myth, is tentatively confirmed, pending confirmatory orbital analysis. No human telescope has had sufficient resolving power to distinguish them from their parent in thousands of years, though dwarven records and precursor texts mentioned their existence. 
Due to a lack of surviving records, it's impossible to tell which of the ancient dwarven names matches which body, hence the author reserves the right to assign names to these moons, and dub these the Expulsive, the Brilliant, the Jubilant, the Blushing, the Mirthless, the Ignorant, and the Slumbering, in order of luminescence. They vary in size, though each is smaller than Halan, and range in shades of grey, from shale to flint. Commentaries and Hypothesis Yet again, another planet's surface defies observation. Larger planets seem to naturally tend towards thick, obscuring atmospheres, perhaps indicating their formation occurs under different circumstances. Tarolsten and the Seven Dwarfs, as they are known by the men of Kannor, have the distinction of being the sole celestial bodies to maintain their original dwarven names, though those of the moons are frequently crudely translated. While many dwarven astronomers are offended by this association of the diminutive size of the moons with our people, it is likely this less than flattering association that has made the dwarven names of these celestial bodies so widely spread. Long reduced to mere fables and folklore, we have finally brought the seven dwarves back into the scientific record. Maybe there's even more than just seven. Below the surface of the hold, constant digging gave the working crews a feeling that they were merely scratching the surface of the knowledge contained in these grounds. Antique maps showed entire library wings cut off by collapsing ceilings, subsiding floors, and makeshift yet sturdy barricades. Yet to claw out the knowledge contained within, they had to keep digging. One of the diggers was named Fjalki. He had the habit of carrying with him a small key he found in the rubble while working. The key was unassuming, well wrought from high-grade steel, smooth and angular, yet undecorated. Such a key could open any number of ancient doors or chests, untouched since the hold first fell. The metal's quality implied its former owner was a dwarf of considerable means. Thus far, every door remained unopened, every chest unplundered. This was not in itself unusual, every dwarven hold had its share of secret rooms, mysterious passages, hidden mysteries beyond number. Such was part of the joy of delving the halls of one's ancestors. It was practically considered a mark of good fortune to have a mysterious key, for it promised great riches should one be the dwarf holding the right key at the right time. Thus, when Fjalki Stonecarver happened to stop to lace his boot in the second annex of the third corridor, a shiver of anticipation rushed down his spine when he came to eye level with what could only be disguised as it was a keyhole. The key, which he kept on a cord about his neck for luck, was removed with care, and with an intake of breath, Fjalki pushed it inside. He braced himself for the jarring sensation of it catching as he began to turn, but his heart leapt as it turned, as though it were slipping through water. With the gentlest push against the wall, seams appeared in the stone where none had existed previously, and the wall became, unmistakable, a door. It swung open without a sound, soft as silk. Fjalki stepped through, onto the first step of a staircase. Turning clockwise, it went down. Chamber was shaped like a great well, with steps ringing its wall ever downwards. The walls were bare, without carvings, or rails, or even scones for lamps. Fjalki ducked back into the corridor and grabbed a torch from the wall, quickly checking to ensure nobody else would stumble on his discovery. Returning to the well, he held the torch out into the void and dropped it. Torch tumbled down, 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 shadows flickering from the steps in brilliant patterns. Fjalki watched as the torch fell into a hole as deep as the sky. There were mysteries so much deeper. And for these mysteries, a full contingent of armed explorers and adventurers had to be gathered. A proper expedition had to be funded to uncover the secrets of the astronomer's sanctum beneath. For many, the greatest mystery was lurking in the back of their minds. It was it. It was watching. It was waiting. It was eating its way through all that they were. Yet this could not become public knowledge. All afflicted with the terror had to be hidden away. 
Victory over Grombar gave the dwarves control over a new strip of land, a hidden respite in the dense woods neighboring a lonely mountain carved with dark caverns. This was a perfect place to keep the insane safely away from others and an asylum to sequester the insane was set up there in secret. Those who kept their wits debated over the origin of the terror. They tried to establish the nature of the strange phenomenon that cracked the minds of those who looked to the stars. Philosophers, doctors and astronomers sat in council, turning over the undecipherable data that they had been given. Some claimed that the profession naturally attracted those with a less stable mind, creating geniuses and madmen both. Those of a more poetic bend claimed that the incomprehensible scale of the cosmos was inherently disturbing and that such casualties were an inevitable risk of trying to fit the universe in someone's head. A small minority, exclusively of those who had themselves gazed through the darkness between the stars, said differently. They argued that the afflicted were neither paranoid nor insane. It isn't paranoia if someone is watching you. It isn't madness if your delusions are true. Yet the council held the stance that it was simply paranoia until proof to the contrary could be found. Foreign delegations to the Triunic cities did indeed have a better time overall than the folks at home. The humans of the lake had also a community with astronomical traditions, in the heart of the southern cities, in Ikashle. The first dwarven delegation to the city were greeted by the sight of a massive monolith rising alone in a sea of grass. Once they got closer, they could make out the shape of a plateau, 30 feet high, walls as steep as a building, topped by massive towers. They went up a narrow stair carved from the walls of the plateau and reached the top was flat as a marble floor, dotted with buildings more normal than the towers seen previously. The towers themselves were often lined with hanging gardens, which must have fed the city during a siege. They were connected by a dizzying network of bridges, through which one could apparently walk from one end of the city to the other without ever touching the ground. One guide led the delegation through an underground market built inside the plateau, like a cruder version of the work in the Dwarovar, and then up through the many towers and bridges themselves. After a tour through various important vertical gardens, temples, exhibitions and government offices high above the ground, they finally reached the tallest of the towers, atop which the city's astronomers had their observatory. From this peak, they could see the entire city of Ikashle, vast grasslands surrounding it, and other settlements far in the distance. The view downwards was quite impressive, but the view upwards less so. As high as it was, this observatory could not match the altitude of the mountain peak. As grand as the observatory was, it could not hold a candle to the sophistication of the Setsun Kupa. Still, this place had a wealth of material with which the dwarves could speed up their own understanding of the heavens. A deal was struck with the Trionix, access to their research in exchange for a permanent residence for human scholars in Durvajatun, where they could study the stars together with the dwarves. Looking so intently away from the Earth made the state and its thinkers oblivious to some very grounded changes in the dwarven society on the lower levels of the halls. While the Vajatuni revered their ancestors, during the times of Aldwarov, the ancestors worshipped a pantheon of many gods. After its fall, the ancestors believed that the gods had abandoned them and subsequently gave up their faith. With more and more discoveries from the reclaimed holds, more and more citizens proposed that it was the ancestors who abandoned their gods instead, that the pantheon should be revived the hearts of dwarven kind. The stone keepers would have none of it and attempted to crush the heresy whenever they could, within the confines of the law. People learned of Dagreen Everbeard, the chief god of the pantheon. His nature was a contested subject. He was the model every dwarven king aspired to be, wise, just and ruling with a paternal instinct over his realm. In ancestor worship, he was lauded as first ancestor, but in the old pantheon, he was the patriarch of a vast clan of other gods. Both views placed him as first creation of Halana, the Earth Mother, the primordial of Earth. 
They learned of Firfen Golden Hands in a discovered ritual and prayer book dedicated to her. An ancient queen of Andir from the reign of Alduarov, she was said to be the one who first began the grand feat of engineering that turned the Serpent's Veil vale into the bountiful farmland that would, in time, allow Andir to forge the empire. Another god, Anvelin Hearthmaiden, was sculpted from pure elemental essence and intended to be the equal partner of Tagrin, when Halana realized that one individual, no matter how mighty, could not shape the world alone. Anvelin was regarded as divine matriarch, and it was she who judged the gods and maintained order in the court. When death entered the world and ended the era of forging, Lord Grim and Lord Gram suddenly appeared. Lord Grim's role was to gather the souls of dwarven kind, while Dagrin stood stupefied as the oldest of his people suddenly grew weak and perished from the monsters known as age and sickness. Lord Grim wandered the world, gathering the dwarven dead and bringing them to the care of her twin brother, Lord Gram. He, in turn, ensured that the souls of the dead were taken into Dagrin's halls and organized into areas based on their skills and virtues in life. He was the keeper and custodian, ensuring that the dead were rewarded or punished accordingly. The origin of the twin gods was completely unknown and not understood. It remained a subject of intrigue. In 1540, the struggle of faith became heated, state accepted the study of the ancient gods, which angered the dogmatists of the ancestor worship, and the godwake was declared a disaster of religious proportions, the Azirnuk. The stone keepers were essentially replaced by the hearth priests overnight, and their sudden marginalization was unbearably insulting. A large part of the issue for people who remained devoted to ancestor worship was the fear perhaps not necessarily unfounded, that the deeds, efforts and tales of their ancestors would be cast aside and forgotten, just like the gods that many of their family and friends now turned to. The state tried to ease these concerns, even if it was not to be painless or cheap. The promise was that the ancestors would still be honored, even if not worshipped. The guards were on high alert while efforts to convert the realm were intensified, unrest was at an all-time high, and demands of autonomy made the estates also question their loyalty to the aloof scholarly class. For the scholars, there was no bigger threat than the astral terror. History showed that, if underestimated, this plague could drag the entire great hold screaming into the abyss. They worked hard, away from the public eye, and many aspects of the disease defied common explanation, yet with time and diligence, some conclusions could be drawn. Astral terror manifested mainly as paranoia, or a fear of being watched, particularly by beings from the sky. But to the severely affected, these observers seemed to be everywhere, emerging from every angle. In extreme cases, this even resulted in violence, whether due to suspicions of affiliation with these watchers, attempts of appeasement, or simply acts of pure desperation. Figuring out the exact cause was surprisingly difficult. The simple answer was that it was caused by looking into space, but why the act of seeing the night sky caused such madness remained a mystery. Common theory was that seeing firsthand how tiny they were compared to the full size of the cosmos was enough to cause anxiety. The dark of the night sky could potentially obscure any number of unseen things, which explained why this anxiety was so often manifested as fear of something from above. This theory, however, was unsatisfying to many. They said these fears were too intense and specific to stem from just seeing the void of space, Another theory thus suggested an inherent magical or psychological property to space itself that caused such symptoms. Some would go even further, proposing an active instigator of the disease. As mentioned, the dark of the night sky could potentially obscure any number of unseen things, and nothing said that the fears of being watched had to be wrong. 
Yet the theories of evil magic or aberrations out in space didn't explain how the madness spread to those who'd never even gazed at the stars. While the proponents of a supernatural cause were quick to suggest supernatural transmission as well, they had difficulty explaining why it only seemed to spread to those who were aware of the terror in the first place. There had, for example, been no incidents of an affected astronomer spreading terror to their family without exposing their condition to them first. While magic that spread through knowledge alone wasn't unthinkable, the simpler explanation was that people simply latched onto the fear once they knew there was something to be fearful of. Seeing others live in fear of unseen watchers could make oneself fear them too, and the fear of your neighbor having contagious madness easily led to the same violent paranoia seen in astral terror victims. While compelling, this explanation was still insufficient to some, as those secondary infectees still exhibited identical symptoms to those who stared directly into the void. It thus seemed impossible to draw an exact line between supernatural disease and mundane social panic. As for mitigation, the most effective method would be simply not using the Setsun Kupa. This was highly unpopular with rulers and scholars who refused to give up on ancestors' knowledge. Luckily, they had found other techniques to alleviate the madness, such as limiting public knowledge, shielding the affected from the sky, secluding them from the uninfected while avoiding total isolation, as well as calming treatments meant to soothe the minds of those struck by the terror. While they did not understand yet the astral terror, they could be able to manage it. They had to take care of the insane and learn to live with it somehow. In the meantime, the chaos of the Godwake entered the court. Many advisors refused to turn to the Pantheon. Debates and discourses turned deadly, with no shame held by offenders on either side. Some advisors suggested holding a large theological debate, followed by a feast. Others suggested simply banishing the ancestor worship adherents from the court. Neither option was without cost in gold or blood. The ever-increasing minority of ancestor worshippers grew louder and more dangerous. In the province of Horn River, one group had even gone to such lengths as to assault and massacre an entire chapel of hapless pantheonists with pickaxes and other mining instruments, with the intention of destroying the temple as an affront to the ancestors. The local guard managed to break in and kill or capture the responsible ones. However, that brought little comfort to the families of the slain and the survivors. Some asked why did people have to be like this? Heretical hatred made even simple trades between locals dangerous and critical industries could in some cases no longer require necessary materials locally, being forced to import from elsewhere in the country. The state's coffers were drained dry to compensate. All the while, Opportunistic orc raiders from deep caves and dark nooks of the serpent spine took advantage of the chaos to raid and pillage whatever they could from caravans or local settlements. With all this happening, the Setsunkupa was still pointed at the sky. Curious eyes were still peering through the lenses, recording the naked secrets of the universe. Research report on the new celestial objects. Adar Ringbeard, Balga Gemhorn, Ragun Azdar. Abstract. This report was ordered in response to the new celestial objects recently discovered by the astronomers of Turvajatun. In the data section, this report will list the data gathered from each individual observation of the new objects, as of the time of writing. In the results section, this report will argue that the available data conclusively proves that all of the examined objects have practically identical orbits, and that this orbit is too close to Halan to explain their lesser visibility in comparison to the known planets, which must instead be explained by ascribing the objects a smaller physical size. In the analysis section, this report will argue that these observations are congruent with existing descriptions of the great asteroid belt known as the Field of Echoes. It will also bring up the existing explanation for the Field of Echoes, such as it having originated from a destroyed planet or from the war between gods and primordials, but 
will argue a lack of evidence to prove or disprove any of these existing theories. In 1549, the expedition to the depths of the Astronomer's Sanctum returned. Tower, as the explorers have taken to calling it, went deeper than any had anticipated. There were sections where the stairs had fallen away, requiring the construction of scaffolding to proceed further. An effort was made to construct a crane at the summit to lower material to the base, but the ceiling of the otherwise smooth chamber was battered and broken. It was likely that an elevator of some kind existed here when the hold was new, but whatever catastrophe befell Dur Vajatun seemed to have ripped it from its housing. Wood, rope and tools were transported down by foot, like mountain goats scaling a cliff and more than one dwarf had lost his footing. The screams of the falling dwarves echoed for longer than seemed possible. With great effort, the tower's foot was eventually reached. The mechanisms of the fallen elevator were battered and broken, topped with the crumpled bodies of the now unrecognizable fallen. A door at the base led into a series of exquisitely decorated rooms. The ceilings were perfect hemispheres, still painted in midnight blue, and speckled with garnets, diamonds and rubies, in mimicry of the night sky. One room seemed to be a council chamber with a circular table carved of granite topped by a magnificent brass armillary sphere. Another was a small library, most of the books long since rotted, yet some etched plates and stone carvings remained. The etchings contained many of the same rooms that decorated the Setsunkupa, and the technicians in the expedition team believed that these were important in understanding the telescope's workings. The knowledge found here was evidently too valuable to be left to the lesser scholars of the hold, hence the secrecy of the archive and its entrance. Those who possessed the keys to the chambers were evidently of high standing and incredible knowledge, perhaps even the builders of the Setsun Kupa. The immediate result of the expedition was a better understanding of the more obscure controls of the telescope and an inkling of the purpose of the enchantments alloyed into its housing. One other benefit was the finding of charts that were trying to predict future meteor impacts. Of special note was one meteor of potentially dame steer that would fall not too far from Dur Vajatun sometimes around this millennium. Rangers were tasked to establish a base near the projected impact area somewhere in Ilmeitsa to catch it when it finally falls. Mages also believed that they could shorten the time until impact with just a little nudging so that the state could harness this resource as soon as possible. One folk saying in the Northern Pass said that nothing lasts forever, not even sadness. And finally, in 1551, the religious civil war seemingly ended. The chaos of the god wake began to cool down as the nation settled into a new status quo. High Queen Gruya embraced the pantheon of the ancestors and there was no changing back to the old ways. The Dwarven Pantheon came with a list of new rituals and dogmas. On a regular basis, different relevant gods would be praised in the temples. One major god, accompanied by a host of two minor gods. At the end of a cycle, a great ritual feast would be held in celebration of the chosen triune, which would come with immediate benefits depending on the chosen three. Then the gods would be allowed to rest, and a new set of gods would be subsequently chosen for praise and ritual celebration. The rituals had very palpable results, but these godly rewards were still not fully understood. More study and more discovery in the other holds was necessary to understand the pantheon and unlock potential new gods to worship, but at least the turmoil was over. External dangers on the ground level became less and less threatening. If dwarves knew anything, it was how to build and maintain forts. With the northern pass and the Serpent's Vale surrounded by fortresses, the heartland of Durvajatun was secured. In the tunnels to the south, Verkal Kozenad was fighting squatting orcs and kept the flank secure as a neutral, non-hostile nation. Though the currently named Sapphire Dwarves arrived in the Serpent Spine from Kannor, by this time, they had lived isolated for so long that most of them never even stepped foot in Kanor before. The Green Tide had a significant success despite the efforts of the adventurer kingdoms, and the great kingdom of Gaved 
caved in between pressures from Grombar, Laurent and their slaver cousins in Vertesk. The world was just waiting to be rediscovered, while the ninth major observation was underway in the observatory. 1554-02-25-1258 Extrapolations from the asteroid's recorded movements predict an orbit where the asteroid will pass extremely close to Halan once every 111 years. Projected past and future dates for the asteroid approaching to Halan include 922 after Ash, 1033 after Ash, 1144 after Ash, 1255 after Ash, and so on, all during the month of Tearfall. Conclusions As can be seen, the past passing dates coincide with the greatest Damesteer showers in modern history, all supposedly caused by the so-called Oracle's Eye Comet. With these facts in hand, the writer sees no other reasonable explanation than the Oracle's Eye hypothesis being true, and the observed asteroid's true identity in fact being that of the famous comet, responsible for the vast majority of Damesteer meteors during recorded history. A great breakthrough in our understanding of the origins of Damesteer. If the Durvajatuni could clear a way to a western port, they could perhaps open new links between dwarves and the humans of Kannur. New trade routes, settlers and exchange of knowledge could prove invaluable, so it was decided that pushing into the lands of the Grey Orcs would be one of the next goals of the Dwarven Kingdom. A brave delegation still managed to stealthily traverse hostile lands up to the very heart of Anbenar. After an arduous journey, they had to endure a final long trek up Moon Mount. A bit too tough for less physically capable scholars, but all who had ever set foot in a university knew that the reward at the top was worth it. The Moonmount Library was vast, with tomes and scripts from almost every age and every land, including original texts from the time of Aldwarov. Access to the library's contents was controlled by the priests of the Dame, who oversaw everyone entering the building or picking a book from its shelves and archives. They permitted few to view the records at all. The Sapphire Dwarves had an advantage though. Damish priests eagerly collected all the knowledge they could get their hands on, but took special pride in their knowledge of the night sky, where their goddess makes her home. The Moon Mount Observatory was one of the oldest and most advanced observatories in human lands, but it still couldn't compare to the views from the Setsun Kupa, of course. By sharing astral knowledge with their temple, the dwarves negotiated themselves privileged access to their archives, and even managed to take a few interesting texts home growing their knowledge even further, even if none were wiser than them in regards to the heavens. The Triunix, even if sandwiched between the Forbidden Plains to the south and the cold bitter sea to their north, were not completely cut off from the outside world. The dwarves had heard tales of a great fleet that sailed from their ports every ten years, rounding the coast and reaching the ports of Halles to trade spices, silks and knowledge of distant lands. Queen Gruya decided to secure spots on this mighty fleet for her delegates, for who knew what secrets were known by the scholars in the Far East. The first and arguably most relevant stop was in the bustling city of Tian Lo. Everything was big there, massive high temple at the city's heart, the largest in Halles. The great storm which could be seen across the sea on clear days like an entire mountain range of wind and rain. And of course, the city itself which was no less impressive than Sarisung or Sarmaya. So too were the riches of its merchants massive, due to the profits that could be made if one had the right goods. Durvajatun possessed exclusive knowledge, and exclusive meant valuable. By making the right deals and forging the right connections in Tianlo, they had been able to leverage the latest scientific and philosophical works from Durvajatun for a high profit from the city's merchant and ruling classes. A deal well made and an incredibly valuable connection. Knowledge of the world brought not only material riches, but also modern institutions such as the printing press. But there were indeed so many material riches. Regardless of their thirst for knowledge, at the end of the day they were just dwarves, and nobody would be more happy to earn and pile up gemstones, gold and precious metals such as the dwarves. After enduring monsters, madness, religious violence and war, the 
Dwarves were about to endure the consequences of their own greed. Horde curse was just the next disaster on the growing pile of troubles. Yet not the robber barons, not the revolting workers, not the corrupt officials and neither the greedy banks could stop the astronomers from their work. Notice, celebration in the Azure Hall. As you may have known, Kotrek Bofgribal and his team have recently observed a new point of light which moves like a planet, yet appears much smaller than the observed planets. The data is clear, however, that this new object is not an asteroid, but instead a very distant planet. Though orbital records of Hislana, the hidden rock, have all been lost, this new object can't be anything else. This marks a joyous occasion not only to disprove those who said the planet didn't exist and our ancestors had lied or made a mistake, and not only as a restoration of our ancestors' lost discovery, but as proof that we are every bit the astronomers that the original sapphire dwarves were. To celebrate, the High Astronomer has invited everyone whose work relates to the Setsun Kupa for a feast in the Azure Hall. 1800 hours, next Seeds Day. Bring your finest clothing. The astronomers were cheering and celebrating New Horizons in a universe that they could claim as their own. 1578-01-04-02-11 The color of the lunar craters in this observation, when combined with those of existing observations in different lighting conditions and corrected for the color of the moon's regular geology, shows a 95% match with the color of Damesteer in multiple of the larger craters. The color of the lunar anomaly, however, when subjected to similar scrutiny, shows no conclusive overlap with any known naturally occurring minerals or metals. Commentaries and Hypotheses The association of Damesteer with the Moon has existed for many centuries, going at least as far back as the Damerians. They believe the Moon, or rather the Dame, to be the source of Damesteer. More modern theories have largely abandoned the Moon as source hypothesis for the Moon as recipient, pointing to the Moon's many large craters, seemingly formed from meteor impacts. Famously, the Order of Chroniclers, in cooperation with several wealthy and Bencost philanthropists, have issued a notable reward for anyone able to conclusively prove the existence of Lunar Damesteer. I believe this latest data finally proves the hypothesis beyond reasonable doubt. The anomaly, on the other hand, seems completely absent from the historical record before we discovered it. And instead of giving any clear answers to its nature, this latest data only confirms its abnormality, as it is not located inside a crater and its color doesn't match that of any expected lunar geological phenomena. We might have to embrace some more fantastical hypotheses. While the potential of a serious planar breach, as in Yezel Mora or the Deep Woods, has been brought up, the more pervasive theory instead looks to the only pre-existing predictions of abnormal observations on the Moon. Sapphire Dwarf's search for interstellar constructions. The possibility exists that we are dealing with some sort of monument or outpost made by ancient interstellar enemies of Aldwarov. 22nd of Neramend, 1582. Urgent summons. For those of you who are not aware, in the past months our astronomers have discovered multiple unusual objects orbiting within and above the atmosphere of Halan. After much study, these satellites had been determined to have highly irregular orbits, well beyond what can be expected from a natural body, and their forms do not match the expected shapes of naturally occurring objects in our solar system. The only conclusion is that these objects were at some point artificially crafted and transported to our atmosphere, either from Halan or somewhere beyond. The leading theory is that these things were made by the same interplanetary empire that fought against Oldwarov in ages past used as either intel scryers or long-range weapons. As we still don't have a clear answer for the fate of this empire, we must entertain the possibility that they are still around somewhere and that these devices are still active. An emergency meeting has been declared for the High Command to discuss how to deal with potential threats. Do not speak of the contents of this letter with anyone outside of High Command. Do not act like you have been informed of anything outside of the ordinary. Do not read this letter under the open sky. We do not know who or what may be watching us. Let's hope that they're nothing but relics.
The different nations of the lake eventually united in a grand federation. The trips to Hales became a direct dwarven responsibility. The new nation of Kalistosovk shifted its priorities significantly, and so did their allegiances. So dwarven delegations could not charter trips on the grand treasure fleet anymore. Durvajatun, increasingly distraught by madness and disasters, found itself strangled between an unholy alliance of Grey Orcs and Trionix. They were forced to fight their way west tooth and nail to reach Balvroren with its wondrous Balgaric Tower and its massive port on the giant's grave sea. Naval bases were quickly converted and improved. From here, the Sapphire Dwarfs could establish connections with the City of World's Desire, arguably the center of the Surfacer's world, Anben Kost, home of the Order of Chroniclers, great contacts to the Imperial Archives and in direct neighborhood with the Magisterium. In 1596, a Dwarven envoy stepped into a city like no other, gathering goods and people from all over Halan. Truly anything could be found if you knew where to look. This was just a strew of its people. While still mostly dominated by the same humans, dwarves, elves and halflings, the city indeed sported a much more variety of population than in the ancestors' stories regrettably including ancient enemies such as orcs, goblinoids, giantkin, and dragonspawn. Still, the interconnected nature of the metropolis was a boon, as whoever became famous in Anbenkost became famous in Halan. By appearing at the right events and impressing the right people, word of the sapphire academic greatness could be spread far and wide, far further than the Vajatuni messengers could personally reach. This gave the dwarves an unparalleled access to the latest trends, news, and relevant institutions of the time, and in turn allowed them access to a larger network of scholars than ever before. Magisters who have long overseen the rune smithing of Silverforge were more familiar with rune magic than anyone else in Kannor, and some volunteered to travel to Durvajatun to study the observatory. The runes of the Setsunku power unlike anything ever seen since the fall of Aldwarov, but the diverse magical expertise of the Magisterium gave them access to tricks and tools that were beyond what the dwarven runesmiths had been able to do or ascertain. By examining the way that magic from each rune flowed through the Setsunkupa, they've been able to investigate the observatory's functions in a novel way, bringing a more complete understanding of its work so much closer. They could also be witness to the most groundbreaking observation ever prepared, a close inspection of the very surface of Agradent, hoping to see an unprecedented amount of detail that could prove to be the greatest scientific discovery since the day of ashen skies. 1599, 10.26, 24.47 The observations confirmed the existence of thin lines across the surface of Agradent, wide enough to be seen from space and long enough to stretch considerable lengths of the planet's surface. These lines run between Agradent's larger bodies of water, as well as the planet's frozen poles, but their shapes are far straighter than any rivers observed on Halan. Precise list of estimated proportions for each observed line included in the appendix. The observation also estimated the planet's great bodies of water to be slightly smaller than in the earliest recordings and the red portion of the planet slightly greater in accordance with the previously postulated hypothesis that the planet is slowly drying out. Hypothesis, the large amounts of water found on Agradent has always opened the possibility of life, and these lines look more than anything else like massive canals. The astronomer found himself unable to keep writing the report. Instead, he left his desk and went to watch the stars. Not through the many glass barriers of the telescope. No. Instead, he went out the small door at the side of the observatory and stood directly beneath the sky. To his south, an endless line of massive mountains snaked off into the horizon, though none as high as the peak he was standing on. In every other direction, east, north and west, an infinite sea of trees stretched out as far as his eyes could see. Far beneath him, the outer sections of Durvajatun itself jutted out from the mountain, winding road which tied it to the flat ground, occupied even at midnight. But it was not downwards his eyes wandered, but upwards, to the great night sky undimmed by neither cloud nor light, the great cavern with its endless diamonds. He knew each one by heart, and spotting Agradent posed no problem for him. 
The idea of intelligent life in the heavens had been posed ever since the ancient sapphire dwarves first learned the planets to be outer worlds just like Halan. Yet it had always been guesswork and hypotheticals. But there, in the glimmering point of light, he was certain. There, beyond the great black void, he was looking at it. Life, civilization, monuments to rival the greatest of dwarves, at the peak of the world, with no one but the stars to hear, he uttered the words, We will go there one day. I know it. Durvajatun Hold was once the center of knowledge for Al Dwarov, but that was not the one from the 17th century. Instead of merely attracting dwarven scholarships, their net stretched wider. Their libraries now held manuscripts from Kanor to Hales, from Laurentaine to Tugayasa. Connections in the heart of printing, Conwell, allowed the access to the best of the best printing devices. Adapting the Conwellian technologies and leveraging the vast restored rail network in the Serpent Spine, the Dwarven findings spread as far as their printed books could travel at a rapid pace. Astronomers from all over Halan gathered for a chance to use the Setsun Kupa. The Sapphire Dwarves of Turvajatun were reborn, greater than ever before. Their prosperity was limitless, their knowledge of the universe beyond anything in the history of Halan. Even the Astral Terror, while unfortunate, had proven to be manageable. But then it happened. It came without warning, predicted neither by the astronomers nor the prophecies. Suddenly the sky was lit ablaze, red fire raining down as molten rock heralded the true calamity, a meteor from beyond Halan. When it hit the surface of the salt grass lake, water was instantly vaporized. No splash was heard or seen, instead there was a gigantic explosion that echoed off of the very mountain surrounding it. When it was over, what water remained rushed back into the hot crater. The lake now transformed, partially filled again. The water would remain hot for days, and warm for weeks as the molten rock slowly cooled down. The surrounding area was hit with unfathomable destruction. In a radius of miles upon miles, all windows had shattered in the wake of the shock. Trees were cut down like toothpicks, skeletal remnants lying flat on the ground, their leaves blasted away. It was a catastrophe. The High King declared an immediate emergency state to reduce the devastation in the area, before proceeding to investigate what happened. As life slowly returned to normal around the lake, the settlements recovering from that devastating impact, something else had begun happening. The water, back to its spring-fresh coldness, had begun to glow ever so slightly in the night, an entrancing display of colors that were hard to define. The display drew locals in, color burned itself into the back of their heads. When they left, they dreamt of it and couldn't stop themselves from returning. As time went on, the glow became stronger, the colors more vibrant, vigorous like a being solely consisting of that ever iridescent display. Within it, one could lose themselves, watch its intriguing images for hours, days on end. Whoever looked within saw, they saw something, something which they could not describe. Yet still they returned to marvel at its beauty, to bear witness just once more, just one more time tomorrow, Make sure it was still there, just one more time. Aside from that, no other side effects had been observed. Slowly the suspicion and weariness of the strange color gave way to fascination and curiosity. People, travelers from all around, began swarming to the lake to look at the colors as well, to see and experience the strange wonders it promised within its iridescence. This had led to some opportunistic dwarves to profit off of the sudden influx of people. They had set up shops and other attractions along the shore, advertising this great display of the wonders of nature and even selling some of it in the form of a dye distilled from the water. The chromatic aberration that fell to the saltgrass lake was initially harmless, 
but it started to eventually have some unusual side effects. Many of the visitors to the blasted heath, though evidently able-bodied, became ill. They sat in their camps by the lake, watching the water ripple in its pearlescent hue. And though they ate the fruit from the nearby trees that had grown to phenomenal sizes and with an unusual gloss, they looked like they were wasting away. Several deaths had been reported from starvation, and those who still lived became yet stranger. Deer walked to the shore, transfixed and calm as babes, and then strode into the water, never to come out. More disturbing still, the keepers of the nearby asylum in the lonely mountains reported that their patients had become agitated. Many stood in the center of their cells, glassy-eyed and unresponsive. Despite receiving no news of the bizarre events outside their sealed homes, they all faced the lake. The area had to be investigated by the authorities, but the glowing terror gripped the whole realm. The suppressed astral terror manifested itself in that cursed lake. As a small contingent of guards from the capital arrived to inspect the area firsthand, they discovered more than what was initially believed. What the citizens saw was only a fraction of the truth. The inspectors reported an attack on their camp by something that was described as an abomination of nature. They glowed shining even at day. Their skin had become a meld of nature fused with branches and animals who screamed out in pain. Their faces sagged and drooped as their skin fell off their face, revealing flesh covered by a tinted substance not of this planet. They could no longer speak or comprehend. They wandered mindlessly, slaughtering whoever came in their path and melding with them to continue their spread. All communications with the Lonely Mountains had been effectively cut off by these hordes, and they could only imagine what horrors were going on inside the asylum. The contagion had to be stopped. If they were to save friends, family, homes and lives, then the mutants had to be slayed. They had to make up for letting those innocent people of Saltgrass Lake and Lonely Mountains to be converted into those things. Those things! The whole army of Durvajatun was called to action against the glowing horrors. When their ancestors first started looking at the skies, the glowing plague was the last thing that they ever expected. Did something somewhere wish to teach them a lesson about peering at things beyond their world? Intentional or not, this incident had taught them not just about the dangers of the cosmos, but also about their ability to face them. As they eradicated the last of the mutants, the final traces of that terrible light they spawned from, they were more resolute than ever in their quest to explore the greatest of caverns they knew as the night sky. Though the wretched glow was gone, it had left behind a hue of similar color, which now covered vast swathes of the land around its point of impact. It didn't spread like the glow did, and while that unworldly color was interesting, it lacked the compelling allure of the light before. If that glowing light was a living being, these lifeless pigments left behind were its corpse, if even that. As it seemed to have lost the dangerous qualities of the glow that preceded it, some dwarfs had started using this alien color as dye again. Many were worried that this will just lead to a repeat incident, but most refused to let the fear of that horrid plague hold them back. Now that they knew which warning signs to look out for, they wouldn't be caught unaware a second time. Guards were installed to keep watch over the lake for any signs that infectious lure of the glow could be returning, and they would never let this anomaly from beyond to threaten their people again. Surely, they had learned the right lesson. Evidently, the Vajatuni learned so much, and yet nothing. They eventually gave into open madness due to the astral terror that built up over the ages. To most, it was a day like any other. Some claimed to have felt a presence passing over them, like that of a light breeze. But those infected with astral terror seemed to sense something more. Like a lid blowing off, the infected had stirred to life, and many who showed no previous signs of the terror have joined them. Many simply ran around in panic or gazed transfixed at the sky, but others were actively lashing out at any who came near. A large number had banded together to attack the uninfected. Assaults and riots broke out all over the country. Many of the instigators believed that the only way to free themselves was the utter destruction of 
Durva Jatun itself. Whether it was a malicious force at work, seeking to stop the dwarves from uncovering the truth of their cosmos or not, it was clear that there was going to be a civil war. Neither a stellar god nor deranged madmen would stop the quest for uncovering the secrets of the universe. The disaster took some time, and the cost was paid in many innocent lives being snuffed out in the name of sanity. Eventually the riots have ceased, and all remaining infectees were put again under proper supervision. The terror incidents stopped, and the astral terror was removed from the kingdom, at least for some time. The risk of reoccurrence was real, as long as the dwarves would keep looking at the night sky. Nobody was in the mood to celebrate at the end. The people were exhausted, malnourished, and many had the experience of killing someone close to them. It was probably safe for all to postpone the reopening of the Setsun Kupa, at least while the nation was recovering. And that was Durva Jatun, an amazing story and so much to unpack. I feel like I've been talking for days and yet this was just half of the in-game playtime, only 200 years. I've read complaints that the mission tree ends a bit abruptly, but I think it's the fault of it being so compelling and interesting. It feels to me personally that it ends when it should, especially if one intends to rebuild Aldwarov and then continue with the planned mission tree that will be released in the future. Either way, the excitement of exploring the mysteries of the cosmos makes this tag stand on top of my favorites list in Anbenar, only superseded perhaps by my all-time favorites, the Kaldromak. I was surprised at the end of the campaign how little I actually expanded. I didn't care at all to conquer lands, which is quite unusual for me. I tend to prefer aggressive white play, but in this particular case, I naturally shifted to playing tall without even thinking about it. Durva Jatuni troops are not particularly strong, but they always have a technological edge against their competitors, which is very fitting. The new update really added to the experience, especially with the introduction of the vanilla changes for ideas and estates. I ended up starting with the infrastructure and exploration idea sets so that I could have 9 or 10 development colonies from the very start, using the respective policy and Age of Green Tide bonus. I find myself eager to explore different versions of Dwarven idea openings for maximum rewards. I have this feeling that there is no definitive correct meta and I love it. I mean, there might be a correct meta for Dwarven adventurers idea sets, I just didn't figure that out yet. The Dwarven Pantheon was also interesting, though I don't know how to feel about abandoning the ancestor worship. It almost feels mandatory to have to give up on your previous religion. The Dwarven Pantheon religion is extremely strong and clearly superior. My one comment is that the mechanics make it feel a bit volatile, and I can feel the loss of comfort, which is granted by the stability of the bonuses offered by the ancestor worship mechanics. Ironically enough, the free stability boosts from some of the rituals are actually insanely good. The Pantheon's shifting deity bonuses are still a mystery to manage, and I need to take some time to test and document the different ritual results someday for clarity and science. Extra Expedition Wonders was also welcome. Delving through new dungeons was a treat, and it made a great set of mechanics even better. It feels fun trading in dyes and silk when you're a dwarf holed up in a frozen rock at the northern edge of the world. That's it for this year. Warm thanks to the amazing Anbenar team. Warm thanks to the amazing Patreons and members. And warm thanks to you for listening to this story. I wish you all happy holidays, a happy new year, and a 2024 free of madness, whether it is mundane or magical. See you next year. Cheers. <laughs>